Have you ever met Johnny Depp? Never met Johnny Depp. I feel like he'd be a legend amongst actors. When I first started getting into it, I remember people would ask, do you get nervous around people? Have you ever been starstruck? No, I never have. It kind of feels like I'm hanging out with actors who are pretending to be what my friends do for real. Hi. Dude, my friends are the real world champions, professional athletes. And then that begs the question, aren't we just all pretending to be something anyway really in everything are, yeah. we do? haircut today okay and I kind of feel like uh I kind of feel like the guy that cut my hair is going a little for some <laughs> for some like Johnny Depp vibes dude you feeling you know? the job hey maybe he was Johnny Johnny's dude, been in, in the news lately in right honor, <laughs> in honor in honor of, honor of, of our dear friend of in honor of JD <laughs> have you ever met Johnny Depp never met Johnny Depp but he like seems a, in, like an interesting cat I feel like he'd be a legend amongst actors or no I gotta know if that world crosses oh, over much. Man. You're not legend. all four people. I don't even know. Do I even? It's hard. Considering actors and legends are, are kind of hard for me. <laughs> it's hard. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it just right seems in, like dude. it just seems like. Uh, I don't know. I I think I, maybe that's an okay term. It's like you're good at your job. Congratulations, type of thing. Like me well, too. Or it's hard it to like... be like, hey, you're so good at like pretending you're good, oh, like pretending. Geez. Maybe not pretending you're good, but pretending you're somebody else. And I don't know, in coming from the jujitsu world, like I don't know actually how that really vibes with me. Interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah, because like, you're you're all about the honesty of jujitsu. Exactly. And then you're exactly. praising, but you're also like your day job literally is is fake, pretending right? to not be <laughs> exactly. Or maybe your job actually is more making it more real, right? That's right. My job Which is, is why more you're... making it. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. I, I think too, like, I think back of like... You, know, you get what I mean by that, right? Absolutely. Because like you're, you're in stunts. Mm hmm you're a stunt actor, which means you don't have a stunt double for your stuff that you do, That's which means right. that you're actually doing the real thing. We're doing the real thing. And recording it, exactly. basically. But, and and we're doing real it as than... real as possible. Right. Not necessarily... I don't know. I, I guess saying, I just though, don't yeah. know. Yeah. It it, bring, it it brings me back to like when I first started getting into it, I remember people would ask me like uh questions like, "Oh, do you like do you get nervous around people or like um have you ever I think people would ask me the question, "Have you ever been um like starstruck?" Uh, is yeah, the yeah. word they would use. Uh -huh. And I think the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, "No. I never have." And, and I, and what I really can't, would decide it is that it kind of feels like act, in a way that I'm hanging out with actors who are pretending to be what my friends do for real. Yeah. Meaning like, <laughs> dude, my friends are the real world champion, champions of the world. Like professional athletes. Professional athletes. Like, I think they're pretending to be what my friends are. And then that begs the question, like, aren't we just all pretending to be something anyway really in everything are, yeah. we do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, okay, because then you say, like, your friends are professional, what, fighters. Right. But they're not actually fighting in real battle. They're fighting for sport. They're fighting for not sport. Not to call yeah. you or yeah. them out. No, yeah, you know absolutely. I mean? but like, and and I'm, I was the first one to even it's say, It's still like, even a liars. derivative of, like, war itself, which is the real thing. And then even then you could say, like, well, in a spiritual way, isn't war itself actually just like uh playing out of like a, a bigger war that may or may not be going on behind Absolutely. the scenes you know what i mean you see what Absolutely. i'm saying with that yeah, it's like all derivatives can, kind of of something that's then maybe even bring it real. back to like what really is of like good versus evil right is it really just good versus evil here like are we bringing it back <laughs> dude to how long how far are we into this one and we're just already <laughs> yeah. in the straight up deep end <laughs> I feel like Bjorn's dude, over here. Like dude. you guys need to like do some uh, floaties in the in the <laughs> shallow end, and we're being richer. Just like, nah. dude, we're no way we're running. <laughs> so for those watching, we haven't we haven't filmed podcasts in how long has it been? Uh, three months. Has it been that long? Almost three months. Wow, years is flying by. Huh? Dang, dude, yeah. I don't have so much to update you on, and then half of it I can't even say on camera with people listening. <laughs> For real, dude. No way. What have you been up to, man? How's your family doing? Been busy. Um, shooting movies, I see. Shooting, making movies, uh, making commercials, um, 
some jobs not working out. Um, that big one you were supposed to be on that ended up falling through. It just ended up not really working out. Like they they were way over budget. Um, it was like a two hundred million dollar budget, right? Uh, yeah, huge, huge. Holy crap! Sometimes That's like Marvel. It, it's status. hard to say this, but like do sometimes. You know, do you know what it was? I do. You can't do. say can't probably, say huh? At all, I can't say. Which is saying a lot for you because yeah. Um, and, and I got more, Meaning like, I know people who are, have been on the, who they're wrapped, but I know people on the show and I kind of found, found out a little more what, what was happening. It's just, I, sometimes I expect people, especially big companies to be more organized than that big dude, productions. And, and the truth is, is they're probably less organized. Dude, isn't it just true that like pretty much everybody just sucks at their jobs? It, that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. Yeah. So it's like, really? <laughs> When you see something that's like actually excellent, like you watch a Christopher Nolan movie or something like that, or you hear about how like um, like Spielberg was in his early days of directing and like how tight of a ship, uh, who was I just watching? Um, freaking, who's the one that did um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? In Hollywood. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Freaking, who, what's, the, what's this director's name? He's, uh, I should know. And he's exactly only going to do a certain amount of them too. Yeah. Right? He's got like all these rules. Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. And like how tight of a ship he runs. And it's like, that's like the best of the best in mm -hmm. a multi-billion dollar industry. But we still like a lot of stuff that's produced. It just actually sucks compared to how good they are because they're yeah. like operating at just a higher level than everyone. Yeah, and there's just so many levels in the film world, right? Of like, there's so many moving parts, right? So you have like the very beginnings of like casting, you would say, right? People yeah. who who do the casting of who's going to play what character or stunt stunts has to go through casting as well. Like who we're going to hire yeah. to do these jobs. And then once you get to that point, then you have actually, then the director is really going to be like, Hey, I like your look or I like this person or I like who's sure. doing this. And then after that point, you still have like the whole editing thing, right? Like people can totally just get completely edited out of the whole movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's wild. Dude. So like, there's just so many le levels to it. Like even, even, and, and I've even been in things that like they never even come out. Really? Yeah. Like I've done, like sometimes you'll do pilots. Actually, once you I just did a pilot recently, right? I did a pilot recently. Yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes you do pilots and like, dude, there's a high probability. Like you'll never see that. Really? You'll never know what it looked like. Dude, that's wild. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? And then like, then, then it's crazy too. Cause at the end you're like, if you ever watch a part of it or some of it, you're like, dude, it just feels like I'm watching like the cliff notes of what we did, what took us like six months to do. Yeah. And <laughs> you know you're seeing I mean? like this much. And of you're it. seeing this much. And you know every single thing, uh, where everybody was, who you talked to that day, yeah. um, what it was like um doing a stunt for the ninth time in a row and people are exhausted <laughs> yeah. and we're tired and we're in the back and Rich is still messing with people. You know what I mean? Like you know the whole story. <laughs> yeah. But like in the scene it's like, dude, oh that was me for that was two it. seconds. That was it. <laughs> Like that's the whole thing yeah <laughs> you know? dude that's um, wild I, I guess why am i saying it? just because it's so there's just so many things that happen so many levels so many things that have to go right you know yeah that's wild man so many things so yeah we haven't talked in th almost three months like actually talked in almost I three know. months because we, get, we just got into too. this habit of like not talking in between episodes yes. but we'd yes. film every week because yes. it feel, every time well the reason we shot started doing this anyway is because like you and i would have such awesome conversations off camera and mm -hmm. then one day we were just like dude we just need to turn a camera on for these because Let's they're just so good right and <laughs> this is how we really are in nor in like these oh, are how yeah. our conversations oh, go yeah. it's like right away you're like bro <laughs> yeah. i was thinking about like the meaning of life and you know the stars and all that and then we just like right in the deep. <laughs> but um anyway so we're coming back starting to film again even though this will be only, this will be released like only 10 days after the previous one but yeah it's been a while we haven't caught up in a, in a hot second so right good to see you man good to see you man missed you yeah. guys yeah it's, it's just, just time just flies by right it yeah. just goes by it does dude so it's crazy how fast things happen. I like that some of the responses I've gotten lately are like people really do like the beginnings oh, really? of the podcast. Like when cool. we're just kind of doing our normal thing, right? And well, like when we're just like off almost that like this is how we talk normally. This is how me and you are. Just the energy's out the roof, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I almost feel I was remembering that one time when you were like, Yeah, your your body knows it's like game day. That's oh, how I started feeling again. I was does. like, dude. 
I love this feeling about how I'm just excited to like mm -hmm. excited to see you again, excited to talk about whatever we're going to talk about, excited to take this conversation to like 20 different places. And somehow oh, it wraps up to the same thing. Oh, it's man. Like, and sometimes we got to slow ourselves down. Hold on. Deep breath. Dude. So you should go first, though, on your topic. But I got a good one for oh, this. Man. The next episode. I mean, I'm got happy to go you first. Talk about? I, I do. I have several. I mean, come on. Dude, I got What's three the months main worth thing, of notes. Dude? Right. I got three months Give worth of notes. Give me just like subject right matter. I gotta stay on. If you're writing an email to me. What would the subject line say? This, the subject line would be first. Uh, probably would be good versus evil. Good versus evil. Okay. Uh, which is funny because that's where we went right away. So I we would Gosh, I stay dude. on that immediately. We went there after um, you commented on my space shoes ship uh spaceship yeah, shoes. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh and then i would say failure failure's got to be on there today bro uh, you're and then i have man. a new one for you but i don't want to give you the name of that one yet because we'll keep those ones okay so you can do that one tomorrow because you will do good versus evil and failure. and failure and then next episode i'll do mine yeah i got more insider information on uh the guy I told the yacht story about oh, that bought the yacht company. He's really? basically, yeah. I got some like insider info. Oh. Dude, I got a story that was so good that I I I can't even tell it because it will like endanger someone in my family. So I'm not gonna tell that one, but the other stories that I got are like almost as good as it. Wow. So there's a cliffhanger for you. Um well, tell me a story of something that's going on now. Tell me something good versus evil or along that line. Let me start or it like failure. This. Let me start. It. Let me start it with this. Okay. So, our religion, we believe uh, that Satan, before we came to Earth, that Satan had a plan as well, right? Sure. And we believe um, that Satan proposed, like, "Hey, let me go down and let me do this, mm -hmm. and I will make sure everybody is saved." Sure. Right. Is that how you, how, is that an okay way to say Yeah. It? I mean, would, I think for those that have, don't that? know, dude, this is really interesting because I've been watching a lot of, um, for whatever reason, I've gone down rabbit holes of podcasts where like they talk about like the meaning of life and stuff. And they're mostly like these, um, physicists or huh. astrologists or, um, uh, you know, like they're very sign science geared like podcast. Okay. But they always end with this question of like consciousness and the meaning of life and like origins of life and things like that, right? Which I yes. think is fascinating to hear other people uh, kind of hypothesize about this. But our view in yours and my religion is that, uh, in our faith really, right, is that before, so that there was actually a, um, a pre-life before we came here. So we exist, our our soul is made up of a body and of a spirit and that spirit is like where consciousness i think really comes from mm -hmm. and that we existed before we came into the world yeah as fully functioning spirits that were able to interact with each other in a different way obviously but like um spirit bodies essentially and that god proposed a plan for us to come to earth and gain experience um, that would help us in an eternal progression to have ultimate happiness and joy, like in the eternal realms. Right. Yes. And that in contrast to that plan, but it was a voluntary election to do that, to follow the plan. And part of the plan was experiencing pain and suffering and so on and so forth, learning lessons. And that then, we wouldn't remember this as well. And that we would have a veil over us to not remember parts of this plan or at least like have a cognitive awareness of it but that we would have to have to act by faith and follow our conscience right yes um and the, to the extent that we would follow our conscience we would gain more light and understanding and but to the extent that we didn't follow it we would right diminish in that light and understanding but in opposition to that plan was who we believe was satan or lucifer um, opposed it saying no don't you don't need to do it that way don't go through all this suffering. Let me just save everyone. Yeah, essentially, right. And Is the that, first plan, Christ, Jesus had an idea as well, or Jesus volunteered as well to save people. Yeah, well, knowing that. Sorry, go ahead. So, our the way that um, so we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and we're we don't represent the views of them no. at all. And I'm going to explain this <laughs> oh, in a very no, flawed no. way. Okay. So like, in yeah. no way am I saying yes. I am explaining this perfectly. That would represent the ways of how, you know, this is actual doctrine, but 
so we believe in that a, have a father, Heavenly Father God, proposed a plan that would allow all of his children to gain a necessary part of experience in mortality in order to um, in order to gain fullness of happiness and joy and exaltation uh, in eternity. And the necessary part of that experience was becoming mortal and was falling from grace and experiencing pain and affliction and failure and so on and so forth. Exactly. Now, that was a necessary part of the experience in order to eventually become um, uh, full of happiness and joy later down the road once all those afflictions are taken away. And But as a necessary part of that plan was a savior that exactly. would redeem us from the negative consequences of that fallen state. But the, that fallen state was still necessary, though, in order to it was like a fall forward instead of a fall like down, basically. Yeah. Anyway, so am I explaining that? Well Absolutely. Enough to set That's you up? exactly what I wanted okay. you to do. So uh, for years, I guess in my experience, you guys know my background. You know, my dad died young mm -hmm. um, and my dad had two funerals. He had a Catholic funeral and a Christian funeral. Interesting. My initial goal spiritually at 16 years old was to get baptized in every religion possible right okay uh because i felt like i didn't know my dad i wanted to know my dad at 16 i even felt like when i look at 16 year olds myself at 16 i felt like i really didn't want to know my dad right like sure. I, don't, I don't need you in my life um so I felt like I really missed out and I really wanted to make sure that I'd be able to see him again and live with him again and do my best to make sure that he uh, lived again after death. Right. Interesting. So initially at 16 years old, I came up with the idea of like, if my dad can have two funerals, like why couldn't I have 20? Hmm. Like, I, how about I get baptized in every religion out there and I'll ensure victory and I can actually rescue my dad if he was in the wrong one. So you were basically like trying to cover your bases spiritually mm -hmm. so that one of them maybe would be right and that you would be able to in your view at that time rescue your dad uh in order to kind of help him in the afterlife spiritually or something along those lines yeah maybe it was i wasn't even thinking necessarily rescue him as much as i thought i, I mean i'm in my 16 year old mind and if you've ever sure. known somebody who dies, even even after, even when we're older and we see somebody die, we still think about what happens after death, right? Yeah. Like I don't know how who, I don't know how anybody could escape, um, not wondering what happens after death when you experience and you see death. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was really interested, and I really wanted to know, and um, so I thought, well. If there is such thing as afterlife, uh, then I, I want to make sure that I'm safe and that hmm. I make it right. And then I would imagine if I was able to make it, then I can help others around me, including your dad, including my dad. Got yeah. it. Um, That's a really interesting line of thinking for someone that young. Yeah. Because like I mean, in a way you might say like, oh, maybe you felt naive thinking that like looking back. I don't know. Like. Like looking back, do you feel like, okay, knowing what I know now, that might've been like, that was an interesting way to think about this, you know, in my young mind or something along those lines. Yeah, I do, I do see that it was, it, it's interesting, but like Albert Einstein said, like he says, question everything, right? But I, I feel like, I always say, I feel like that, 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 that cuts it short. What, what he really meant is mm. question everything until you find an, an answer, answer yeah. right? And I felt like I was at that point questioning, um, life and the meaning of life which and that it's, itself is like a mature thing to be yeah, doing at that no. age i think that's kind of what i'm getting yeah at. so i would i would agree with that and then from there i'm like if i do something i don't know how to do anything lazy or, or not all the way so i thought <laughs> yeah. i'm going to do this and i'm going to go all in i will literally listen i will read the quran whatever you want to give me i will read yeah and i'm willing to read um so i mean that that yeah. And I've seen death a lot. I've seen death time and time again in my life. And uh, I don't care who you are. Death is an interesting phase in life. And it's an interesting thing. And it's funny because we we talk a lot of times on our podcast about the instinct to survive, right? We have this, all have this instinct to survive. We like to put ourselves in that situation where, where we fight to live. Mm -hmm. 
But the truth is death is like the only thing that's actually guaranteed to us in this life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like It's like not a funny thing to be laughing about. But <laughs> what, what's funny is I immediately when you said that, I thought of this. Uh, who's is it a Les Brown quote where he's hmm. uh, he's basically like. You know, the only thing we all have in common is that we're all going to die or That's something right. along yeah, those lines. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's more entertaining than that. but And it's kind of wild, right? Even from the moment you're born, like like your body immediately kind of starts to die. Like immediately cells are start to d- disintegrate or yeah. die off. And then, of course, as, as you're young, you get new ones quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you get older, you don't do that. Hmm. Uh, anyhow, so, so with the plan, my son, we were kind of explaining... Uh, to our children, like the plan that how we understand the plan to be right. Sure. And I'm a firm believer in like, I don't necessarily ever want to try to make my kids go one way or an- another, mm-hmm. but I want them because I want them to choose. I want them to know what they're choosing. Right. Right. So, but my wife, when she talks about our understanding of the plan of salvation and Satan's idea or Lucifer's idea, my wife often talks about how like she remembers being a kid and thinking that what, like Lucifer's plan hypothetically sounds like a great plan that she remembers thinking, actually, I would be OK with that. Right. Like somebody's going to come and ensure all of us are are good. Mm-hmm. All of us are successful. Like what's wrong mm-hmm. with that? And the other one was and we would need a savior, savior to redeem us. And it's going to be hard. Yeah. And we're going to all have to in some way be converted on our own, I guess. And is pain what you would and say. suffering. And we're going to have pain and, and suffering. And like you know tragedies unimaginable yeah so so we were discussing this in our household the other night and my son um my wife asked my son like hey well what do you think about this because again we want to inspire thought we want to inspire people to think and my son um whose name samson samson he said uh love that name by the way we said what would you do and what what do you think about that and he said well i would choose jesus plan and we said well why like why what do you why and uh Cause my wife is also even telling him, like, I, I remember thinking Satan's plan was sounded pretty good. And he said, mom, dad, uh, Satan's a liar. And he wasn't telling the truth. Whoa. Bro. How old is Sam? Seven years old. They're seven. They just turned seven recently. Just turned seven. Yeah. Oh my gosh. (laughs) You're freaking kids, dude. So what? So so then I'll tell you what my daughter said, Hallie. Okay. Um, so then then we said we were kind of blown away, right? And we needed to take that in. And then my daughter raised her hand right away, and she said, uh, "I have something to say as well." And Hallie said, uh, "You you know you guys know Satan wanted all the glory for himself." So Hallie said this. Yeah. <laughs> oh he gosh, wanted dude. all the glory. He didn't care if we were really saved. He was just saying that. Yeah. Wow. So, because that's uh, what we understand from our scripture is that's how we have insights into this is like um, basically Satan saying, don't go through this pain and suffering that Jesus is saying is necessary in order for you to experience what you need to know to have knowledge and grow and progress. Because that is the, you can take that off by the way. You don't have to have that on. But um, uh, he's saying, don't go through all the hardship. Let me just fast track you and give me the glory, not him. Yeah. You know, exactly um but that's part of his premise from the beginning was like let me have the glory basically yeah so yeah. what so like have you ever thought about it in that fashion of like looking at those i like those options like well it, it kind of is the begs this r- interesting question right is like if you can religious or not you boil it down to this question is like what would you rather choose to go through r- pain and hardship and suffering right now or to have it easy. Let's just pretend you want to be the best <laughs> yeah, version of yourself. That. Yeah. Well, if I you want to be that. the best version of yourself, you have two choices and you can only choose one of them. Would you do A, pain, <laughs> suffering, <laughs> introspection, realizing how terrible you are and that you need to change and then the fight to change and then eventually you will after forever? <laughs> or option B. <laughs> or maybe, right? Maybe option not B, even for sure. None of that. <sighs> and you don't have the surety that you're going to be better, but you'll at least be comfortable. But you'll do it because you'll you'll convince yourself you want to do option B because at the end of the road someone's telling you you're going to be really comfortable and you can mm-hmm. thank them for the comfort you know yeah that's great because that's like the that is that that in our view of what's happening in that um in that like theology basically is 
the same question that humanity has been posed with since we have come into existence through Absolutely. evolution or however you view that that's the case. Absolutely. Um, is pain now, peace and pleasure later, or comfort now and ultimate pain for forever later. Absolutely. You're absolutely you know? right. And, but it's interesting that you're actually tying that to good versus evil because that actually itself is the ultimate reason why it's good versus evil is because it's truth versus the lie that the easy way will get you what you want. That's right. And like, wow. I mean, this is what me and you talk about all the time, right? Like we all want it. We want to be that successful person tomorrow we all want to be 18 years old and <laughs> super massively successful yeah but like bro the one who's really successful is the one who had to had to grind mm -hmm. had to face failure over and, and over, over and, and over. over again and then that leads me to to failure of like do we cherish things more when we've had to face adversity and failure before we get it Oh, I mean, yeah, dude, absolutely. Absolutely, right? Yeah. Absolutely, we do. It means something different when you have to earn something. Huh. And what does that earn mean? What does it sound like when we're saying earn? Learn, obviously, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fern. <laughs> what else do you get right now with learn? Dude, um, interesting. I actually thought about the story of Job while you were talking oh, about that. okay. Okay, so... Um, and this is uh, a guy giving kind of a talk on Job. He says, uh, as Job in the Old Testament in a time of suffering, some might feel that God has abandoned them because we know that God has power to prevent or remove any affliction. So he does actually, because that's kind of the argument you hear from like atheism essentially, right? Is like the first thing that they point to, it's almost like a broken record. You can mouth the words coming out of their mouth because it's just they're repeating talking points from whoever from forever ago, right. which is. If God really existed, why would he let this that happen? Exactly. It's, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, that's kind of what he's getting at here is like, because God has the power to remove any affliction, which that is actually true, we may be tempted to complain if he does not do it. Perhaps questioning, if God does not grant the help I pray for, how can I have faith in him? Mm -hmm. At one point in his um, intense trials, righteous Job said, and Job obviously, like, I, you know, we believe in even like uh, scholars of the Old Testament mm -hmm. um, can point to some version of the story actually being factually, historically true. But regardless, it's an incredible analogy of like right. life itself. Um, then know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. Though I cry, I have been wronged. I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. That's what Job says at the beginning. And Job's story is like 30 <laughs> chapters or something. <laughs> in his response to Job, God demands. So that's the beginning of Job's suffering. You know, in his response to Job, God, God demands, wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Or in other words, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me? that you may be justified. Jehovah forcefully reminds Job of his omnipotence and omniscience, and Job in deepest humility admits he possesses nothing even close to the knowledge, power, and righteousness of God, and cannot stand in judgment of the Almighty. I know that thou canst do everything, he said, and that thou, uh, that no thought can be withholden from thee. I utter that I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. In the end, Job was privileged to see the Lord, and the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And it talks about just how in abundance he blessed him. But that, so that line is really interesting to me. It's actually the one that keeps ringing in my ears as you were talking um, in my head, which was, wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Which I picture God, what he's saying there is like, you're complaining that you're suffering, mm -hmm. but what if that's actually part of my plan for you to become the best version of you yeah absolutely so just because you don't want that are you going to make me the bad guy because i gave you what would be actually best for you absolutely you know will you condemn will you basically i you know view it as like are you going to create me in the image of god that you want or are you going to make me out to be whatever god you think you need or are you going to learn about who i really am and how i really operate because there's a bigger plan to all of this than your momentary suffering Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, yeah, it, it gets so. It, it, one of my goals for us, man, is just to just 
not for nobody to really agree with what we have to say, but more to just inspire thought. Right. Yeah. I just want us to, to, to I want to hear what people think. I want to know. I want to inspire people to think and mm. just to think about scenarios like that. Like, what does that mean? What does that jo- What does that scripture mean to you? Yeah. Or what does good versus evil mean to you? Mm-hmm. You know, and and we can take take scriptures away from it, and we can say, at what point do you think somebody would be doing something good, and at what point is somebody doing something bad? Hmm. And is that something we have inside of us that makes that judgment call, or is there no such thing? Right, just hmm. basics of like, if you didn't believe anything that we believed. Do you have a line of good and evil? Hmm. Do you have a line of where something is good and something is bad? Hmm. And we can take any subject, right? Is it okay to treat animals bad? Okay, hmm. maybe a little bit. Okay, what about, um, what, is it okay to beat them? Huh. Uh, is it okay to uh, test products on them? Like huh. at what point does your your gauge Conscious kick in, basically? Kick in and, yeah. and start to judge that, right? And start to say, okay, well. At some point, you start dude. to use terms like, oh, well, that's good and that's bad. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, like, and, and the end of the question is, like, is that line the same for everyone? Right. Or right. is truth truth and it's unquestionable, you know? Exactly. Or is there some things that, hey, the, the line is pretty big, but most everybody will fall on uh, fall and say this is bad and this is interesting right like so then going back to this idea of like what what about shortcutting the process and pretending that you can get the end outcome why is that evil because ultimately we would say (laughs) that that itself is actually i mean we would actually categorize that as evil right you have to dive into what i'm saying there to really understand but but like it's the fact that it's it's a lie yeah right is so is that what actually makes something evil is that you're pretending to get something that you won't actually get because you're breaking yourself against the natural laws to get that thing. So you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So like I want to I can claim all day long that I want peace and happiness in my life. But if I do things that betray my conscience that I know are not going to give me peace but they just give me momentary pleasure or comfort. Ultimately, I'm committing evil against myself because I'm actually lying to myself by saying like yeah, I just want to I want to go out and live like a the, a certain life that's full of lots of pleasure, lots of um shortcutting and taking advantage of people to make money and you know, uh whatever like promiscuous uh lifestyle. But at the end of the day, it's I just that's what I want to do and like my good might be different than your good, you know? So you can't argue against it. But at the but but in reality, like you you could make really strong arguments that none of that sh- leads to peace at the end of the day right and so therefore because you're lying to yourself and betraying the natural law that would lead to peace in this case or peace or happiness or um truth yeah like a clear conscience right that you're committing evil against yourself because because that itself is a lie you're pretending that you will get something when in reality it's impossible to with that lifestyle that's like a right. weird example. I don't know. If no, it makes no. A I, I, sense, I feel like I'm following you. And I also feel along with that. Like, that's why we shouldn't be told a, a truth. We should be allowed to learn the truth, whether that truth mm. is like in teaching children. Right. We shouldn't tell them, hey, no, that's not the correct answer. This is the answer versus saying, no, let's let them figure out the sure. answer. Sure. Because it's just more powerful. It's like so, dude. And look at the conclusions that your kids came to in that scenario. Dude, right. Holy cow. It's like so. Right. Because what? So what did Sam say? He said, "No, I w- I don't. I wouldn't trust Satan because he's a liar." Mm-hmm. And so there's something about that that's not true. It's like, okay, that sounds good, but like that can't be true because he's a liar. Exactly. Isn't that profound? And then like, what? Hallie's was Hallie's conclusion about that was he wanted all the glory for himself. Oh, dude, that's just so <laughs> from the mouths of babes, man. Holy isn't, it, isn't it crazy? Yeah. And I just it just blew my mind. I never thought of it that way, and then I'd never been able to put that to how we're phrasing it. Of like, oh, the, if you want goodness, 
the truth is you got to you got to work for it. Dude, yeah. Like if you want to know peace a little bit, you kind of got to know Rutkus. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you want to know and really love those moments, you have to know what it's like to not have those moments. Dude, but what's the first thing that that most people think when they're going through a hard time or suffering is like it's not me right it's, it's whatever true. insert whatever it's blame true. god blame family blame right. whatever but do and look listen to what this guy says here too um it truly is folly for us with our moral myopia to presume to judge god to think for example i'm not happy so god must be doing something wrong mm -hmm. right to us his mortal children in a fallen world who know so little of past present and future he declares, all things are present before me, for I know them all. Seek not to counsel the Lord, but to take counsel from his hands. Anyway, that's just part of our experience here is actually having to learn how to play the long game, you know? Yes, <laughs> yes. And then, and then, so, so next with that, on, on my notes, I have, uh, dude, that's a deep, we could go so deep into we all could, of that. And we can stay right there as well. No, keep going. But Here, just, just, here's another idea with it is, uh, here's a question for you is, uh, where is your joy in failure? Joy in failure. And is there joy in failure? Knowing that now. Okay, how about this question though with that? that is what, why would there not be joy in failure? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so when someone doesn't have joy in the grind of failing and learning, like why? What's your thought on that? It's got to be because they wanted that shortcut. They wanted it to be easy, right? Dude, they wanted yeah. to skip it. It can't possibly be something wrong with me <laughs> right. that I didn't get what I wanted. You know, right. That I mean, I it didn't happen right away. Yeah. Like, you got to you gotta learn to love that failure. You right. Gotta, you got to learn to love failure and be okay with failure and know that there's a difference between failure and quitting. There's no such thing as failure. There's only Dude. such thing as quitting, right? <laughs> and that's where we got to find the difference is what's the difference? Huh. What's the difference? You know? It's like you've always told me with training. It's like, it is okay to fail. It is not okay to quit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Quitting is a choice. Quitting is a choice. Failing is inevitable. Failing is inevitable. Yeah, it is. Well, Napoleon Hill, I mean, you've, you, you really think you are rich and his main part of his philosophy is that you can learn actually much, much more from failure than you can from success. Because it, when you succeed, you look back and you almost have to guess at what variables lined up in order to equal the success. But when you fail, you eliminate the wrong path and can then tweak and make adjustments. And you know exactly what adjustments were That's tweaked right. in order to get the success. Does that That's make sense? Right. Absolutely. Well, I guess really to clarify that it would be like, if you attempt to achieve a goal and you succeed the first time, you won't actually know why you had it, why you oh, achieved that, it. Oh, yeah, that's totally true. But if you fail multiple times, then you can learn all the variables that had to line up for you to succeed right when you did succeed. Absolutely. And doesn't he also say that in his study of people and su of successful people, which is what that book is, right? Yeah, literally. Doesn't he often say the, the amount of failure that somebody had achieved often uh that was as high as they were going to make it as well like yeah the, the failure equated as deep as their failures yeah. were is like the height of their success exactly yeah. right and, and never more than that and so, never more than that yeah, yeah exactly dang dude <laughs> oh dude and if you think about that so think about that from like the imagery or the um like the ultimate like metaphor for that is is the savior is jesus christ right mm -hmm. so what being could you argue is the most joyful of all of them? It, it's it's Jesus. Why? Because he has the joy of of the souls that he saved. And what was the price of saving those souls? It was the deepest of suffering. And so your joy is really only equivalent to the extent that you've gone through pain and suffering to achieve that joy. Absolutely. Right? I, read, I read a book early on or years ago called Believing Christ. This is and, awesome, book. And, which is a great book, yeah. huh? Which described that for me in a way I'd never, never really understood. And he, and he he's basically says what you said is, is he, we often hear people say, "But Christ wouldn't understand, like, but what I've done, the failures I've done, 
or hmm. or wouldn't if you knew all the bad things I've done, you wouldn't want me to be uh, a member of your church. Or if hmm. you knew all the bad things I've done in life, you wouldn't think that I deserve hmm. this. And in the book, it, it really sh- showed me that when Christ was on the cross, like what he what was essentially was ha- was happening when he was crucified is that he'd uh, taken upon himself the sins of the world. So not me and, and meaning. Not only does he know what it feels like for you, but he knows what it feels like of the weight of the world, mm-hmm. of all of our sins. So like hmm. he he understands you and knows you, but even more so because he's experienced and has suffered for all those sins that we've done. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like it, it was kind of just basically saying that we can't ever use exam. We can't ever say he doesn't know what it's like though to, to commit sin. Like, because he, he, he didn't, but he took upon our sins. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. And suffered like the deepest agony of the price of those sins. Um, at least that's, you know, that's what we believe. And so much so that even the scriptures and scriptures, we read that on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm-hmm. I mean, what would have to happen for him to know that? Yeah, I mean, have to. That's like the depths of hell, right there, right? For the most perfect soul, that's him. That's him, kind of like <laughs> scooping the bottom of the barrel of the worst of the worst, and understanding, like, I, I know how that feels too, to feel forsaken by God, even. Exactly, and I, I would venture to say that most of us don't have, have never been forsaken. Mm. Um, and we actually don't know that because our God doesn't really forsake us. Mm-hmm. I mean, but the thickness of, of what Christ did was so deep that even he felt forsaken. Well, and you know, maybe too there, I agree with that, but, and maybe another lesson there too, is like him feeling forsaken actually was because like a per the perfect being who, who, lives the laws that lead to happiness or peace or you know um a uh, uh, clean conscious essentially is that's what jesus we believe jesus was is that he was the perfect man mm-hmm. the ideal man and we're right? not the only ones right every christianity yeah. is, is Christian, <laughs> yeah. civilization <laughs> itself is built on this idea that's of, right I, of modeling the ideal man of, of jesus christ of, sa- right. of a savior right mm-hmm. and um in fact, it's no coincidence that the, the the stories that we cherish are the ones that mimic this savior. <laughs> it's figure. totally that, totally true. Yeah. Um, right. And so, I guess what I'm getting at is like, if what we're saying is true that like mortality is actually kind of a test of faith, the perfect being would not have ever been a distant from God because he was perfectly faithful. And so at some point he would have to understand what that felt like to not have his cry answered or to feel like he had also to walk by faith, if that makes sense. And so maybe that moment was also one of those instances where like it's him actually relating to us in a very specific way in a real way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 um, interesting dude. Wow. And that's so deep too. It's like you could you could probably clip some of this out and be like, "Well, we, it's a, it's just if you're following, you're following." But right. it's, uh, it's just, that's all deep. And if you fast forward to the next part, that's all good too. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Um, dude, what? So here's my question then. I, so, okay. So I was watching, you know, I really like the Yellowstone, right? Yes. I was watching Yellowstone. Yes. I have a disclaimer, I always have to say I watched it on Bay Angel because it's just not my type of show without actually editing just the crap out of it, you know? But yeah. I really like the story. It's entertaining. So I watched the precursor to, to Yellowstone, which is uh, 1883, I think is what it's called. But it's basically okay. the story of the family in Yellowstone that's traveling across the plains to get their land in Montana. And, okay. they're, you know, they fight against like... Uh, they come across like native americans and indians along the way and like smugglers and um you know looters and robbers and stuff and they have to cross rivers and they're basically just getting torn apart by the elements as they get closer to montana right so the whole 
show, this girl, the teenage girl is is basically narrating the show. Okay. And she starts this one episode by saying, because now they're like in the thick of the of the wilderness, basically. They're crossing people dying. Like um, it's just tough. The pioneers are going through like the thick of it, the suffering, okay. right? And she says, like, back in civilization, you know, if you were in the middle of a street and a wagon was coming down the road, a man would be so kind as to like move it out of the way, right? So that he would, you know, it was civilized basically. Mm-hmm. And then she goes, but here in the wilderness, here doesn't care about you. <laughs> and so then she reiterates this and she says, yeah. um, the, uh, the river doesn't care if you can swim. The rattlesnake doesn't care if you have kids. And the wolf doesn't care about your dreams. Here doesn't care. So she's basically saying like, you either level up and learn how to survive or you die. You know? And like, isn't yeah. in a way mortal, like our mortal experience, this journey of like learning how to own our own progression and level up or die basically. And we do that obviously by, uh, in our view, by um, connecting with the source of truth and deity and, you know, following covenants and teachings and that path. But like ultimately it's a, it's not about like how hard I tried and, Oh, I, you know, I tried so hard and God has forsaken me. It's like, yeah, but it's really like, you have to get so introspective as to say like, okay, I didn't cross the freaking river this time because I need to do something different. The river's not going to change for me. Mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, I have to, I have to level up, you know, it just made Absolutely. me think about that. It's not a perfect Absolutely. tie to what we were talking about, but no. it's kind of interesting, right? I, I think it's right on because even the next thing I would even say about failure is, uh, there's something special about failure really. And like, you know, in jujitsu, when I'm teaching people, so, sometimes I'll get somebody really aggressive early on. Yeah, right? yeah. And you've watched me do this where I let them do basically whatever they want. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. And really what I'm doing it's is like bull I'm letting shop. them fail. Mm. Because failure, if you understand how to use failure, failure will make them rethink what they did. And then it lets them become teachable. Huh. You know, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, to- well, totally. fail, boom, crap. What can I do better? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'll take your advice because I tried and I failed. Now I'm willing to hear what you have to say. Yeah. You you see what I'm saying? Totally, dude. You let people try and try and try. You have to allow people to to still use that that, that awesomeness, which is like, hey, I'm going to go get her. Just let me at them. (laughs) And then you're like, okay, watch. I'm going to let you do all that. And Go I'll ahead. let you try five times if you want to. <laughs> and then and then as soon as you're ready, as soon as you accept that failure, you're going to ask the question. Okay. Okay. What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> Dude. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so you're setting huge. them up to be able to learn. And uh, again, that's one of the ways I use that jujitsu is. And some people don't ever need to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Some people are right away. They're right away. Like you, you're right away wanting to learn. Right away, you're like, I don't even need to go to failure. So just teach me. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? But some people you do got to let them say, hey, yeah. if for me, you to believe me, I got to actually let you fail a couple of times. Well, and dude, how often does that happen in real life? Oh, I mean, that is real life. That's right. Real life, <laughs> right? Well, for me, it was interesting because I, I thought I didn't need to go to the brink of failure to understand or the brink of, you know, my arm almost broken or yeah. like, you know, I'm in uh, worrying about like uh, tearing a ligament in my knee or something. But like, it actually was really helpful for me to allow myself to go as far as possible because then when I got, I, I was uh, uh, grappling with this dude who was like super aggressive and he would have broken my arm had I not tapped. <laughs> right. But if I'm just always like, Oh, you know what? It's just going to be fine. I'm like, no, it's not going to be fine. It's, it's, it's fine until your arm's broken. Then That's it's not right. fine anymore. You know? But That's like, right. I had to understand what that felt like to go that far to be like, okay, yeah, let's stay away from that. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Cause like, this isn't yeah. a game of like, he's just going to let up. Like the dude will break my arm if I don't tap. So that, you that know? right there, we're going kind of fast, but that right there brings me to this next quote that I have, which, okay. um, I'm going to skip some things here because you get that with people in jujitsu, right? Where they're like, 
it's like, hey, you're going to play this game? Like, we don't let up here. So, like, you got to tap if you're, like, feeling it, you know? And you get people who just think they're all that and they're indestructible. Like, those are the guys that get hurt. Right? <laughs> okay. So, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff because you've just taken us to the to this <laughs> note. So, uh, okay. you guys all know I, I love Mike Tyson, right? And I, I love to hear what this guy has Dude, to Mike say. Mike Tyson's awesome. One of the things he said was, uh, he said, this is something... Um, this is something that haunted him that a uh, custom auto used to tell him. Okay. And th that's his coach, right? That's his coach. Yeah. Custom auto was his first, his, his real, really his first boxing coach, somebody who really cared about him. And Tyson looks, I mean, he died during Tyson's career, hmm. but um, Tyson's best years were under the tutelage of custom auto. Right. Hmm. And he said, this, this is something that, that cuss used to tell him that actually really haunted him and haunted him for a long time. He said, uh, he would tell him, how you fight your fights will be how you live your life. So you got to be careful the way you fight your fights because the way you fight your fights will be the way you live your life. Dude. <laughs> Mike Tyson must have learned that like subtle profundity <laughs> dude, from his coach because like, you know, when Mike Tyson says something, you're like, there's no way that dude <laughs> sounding like that looking like that just said something that like was that profound Every, you know what like, i mean what? <laughs> like, what the freak <laughs> what the freak yeah. but he, that's that's one of those quotes where like he kind of repeated the same thing circular way yes, but like it kind of hit me different every time in it a way. does like, geez, he dude, even goes huge. on to say he says he goes on he says <clears throat> cuss would tell me all the mistakes all the things that make you successful in fighting all the failures will be the same thing in your life wow i mean how true is that <laughs> how true right? is that right like because like you will if you're trying at all to become a better person or the, a better version of yourself which we should be doing otherwise we are dying right well the truth is it's like <laughs> we are anyway the almost. truth is dude is like someone's always dying there because you're either killing off your old self to become someone new oh yeah or you're you yourself are just letting yourself disintegrate and not ever being reborn you know that's right which is a deep concept anyway but i uh I freak. Where was I going with that? Um, <laughs> but so, how, so, so how you do anything is how you do everything. And your life will take, if you're trying to become a better person, your life will take you to a breaking point. And then you have a crossroads there. You're like, okay, do I like get humble and learn how this was my fault and like introspective and try to get better and like get the courage to come at it again and cross the bridge? Or do I just think like, nah, this is not, I'm good. You know, I don't want to do that. It's like, it's not my fault. It's like it's God's or it's riches or it's whoever Oh, right. Else. Yeah, you know absolutely. I mean? and, and then know that that I think fighting is important. Fighting, whether it's boxing, jujitsu, or even just competing is so important for people so that they can see how they fight. Yeah. So that they can see how they do these things. Are you just all in and you're going to come to a crash? Mm-hmm. Like, cause you're probably going to handle your relationships that way. Yeah, dude. You're literally. probably going to handle your sales that way. Yeah. Are you asking tons and tons of questions and always wanting the best way possible? Cause you'll probably do that in your real life too, right? You'll probably lead that type of life where you're always wanting more. Um, so like all I'm saying is like, even if you don't have experience fighting, when you fight, you, you'll find out how you fight so that you know those things could help you, but they could also be detrimental to you in the way you live your life. Mike Tyson, just look at the way he fought. He was brutal, out of, not out of control, but but probably perfect. The perfect storm, really. Yeah. He was the storm. So like that, that like intense aggression, but like at the perfect times though, you know? Yeah. And like indestructible too, it would appear. But then what happened? <laughs> he lived his life that way blew through everything huh dang dude wrecked everything huh he wrecked it all tore it all to the ground yeah destroyed it all just like he fought huh wow and until he changed that i believe that's why he wanted to fight again i believe that's why he came back recently really because he wanted to see if the change had stuck mm, interesting like this ability to be more controlled in his aggression, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted, I think he wanted to see, did those changes stick? Yeah. When the fight is on, do I stick to my new self? Do I stick to learn my new from rules? the failures of how I used to fight and how that played out in my real life mm -hmm. and then like level up to be a new version of me. Mm -hmm. And we, I go ahead. Sorry. And yeah. I think for him, 
he had to prove it to himself and he had to go in and fight and see if he could actually be calm and controlled and look for the knockout and not just go guns blazing yeah. but to be patient uh -huh. and 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 that's not what he, he didn't have patience when he fought he was all in all immediately right yeah, yeah so i believe he came back because he wanted to see if uh if his changes actually went to the core so you think it was less of can i do this again and more of did I learn my lessons and I'm, am I like a new person now, like mm -hmm. a better, better version? Of I now? believe that. Yeah. Wow. I believe dude. that. You know, I, I think a failure uh, also makes us realize. Well, I think actually one of the reasons why failure is so hard to digest for people is because it makes them realize that like the current version of them is actually not good enough for what they want. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> totally true. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Say that again. So, so f I think failure is so hard for people to stomach because if they face it and the real reasons why they failed, they're scared of realizing that the current version of them is not good enough to get what they wanted. Wow. You see what I mean? Yeah. So like Jordan Peterson says that uh, he has this really super profound like um, insight about goals where he says goals are harsh judges. And the reason why people don't make goals is because <laughs> on the same. Um, so on one side of the coin of making a goal, you have what constitutes success now. So now you've defined what it means mm -hmm. to succeed. But at the same time, the flip side of that coin is you've defined what it means to fail as well. And so wow. why do people not make goals? It's because of the prospect of failure. Now they have a wow. judge against them. So the goals themselves are harsh judges. But that's where my point is like, okay, so if I set a goal and that's how, dude, I've always said this uh, and I, and you and I have talked about this so much. We're like, it's not even about achieving a goal. It's about, it's about what that goal signifies of who you have to become to achieve it. Yeah. Right. So like goals are meant to inspire you to become the person that it takes to achieve them. Absolutely. So if I set a goal for myself, um, let's even just say it's a financial goal, mm -hmm. right? If I want to make $100,000 more this year or a million dollars more this year and I fail, I'm either forced to blame it on somebody else or something else so that I can mm -hmm. feel good about myself or I'm forced to face the idea that who I am was not good enough to make a million dollars more or $100,000 more. Absolutely. And I think because people, because we're so afraid of killing off the old version of us and what that means and how like, because the, the ver current version of me is really comfortable in my current life, right? <coughs> I'm so afraid of killing that version of me off that I would rather say it's not my fault that I wasn't good enough. I'd rather just say like, you know, maybe it just wasn't in the cards or like it wasn't my, you know, circumstances were against me or whatever. But the truth of the matter is, is I wasn't good enough to cross the river. Yeah. Do you think... Man, I think there's more to that as well of like, because we're in, you're in a position, I know I'm in a position where we, we, it's not like we set that goal and then stop. It just means now we're, no, we, now we're setting another one. I mean, all the goals that I set for myself this year, I have already either failed at miserably or <laughs> am projected to fail at. <laughs> right. It's like you get up at our <laughs> level and it's like, like, there is nothing but failure, actually. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So like, what the heck are like, we doing? Because like, where do you go now? Rich is yeah. like, okay, well, okay, Lone Survivor trained the rock stunt double well what do i do next well probably fail at whatever my next goal is because it's there's nothing else oh, because i better put it higher yeah, yeah you know? i better put it higher <laughs> yeah absolutely no you're absolutely right what about um what about this this quote here of like i also have written down of like experiencing the no because failure is kind of like hearing no in a sense right like uh -huh. Um, I want to make a, a million dollars more this year. And then you set out and you go and six months in, you realize the answer to that is no. <laughs> no, you're not. In fact, you're going to make less than you made last year. You know, like How do tumble? we take that? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I don't think so. Not today. No, no. Right. <laughs> and then uh, with that, I have uh how many no's does it take you until you start to give in? 
Ooh, give in. So I think I know what you mean, but describe that for me. Until give in to what? How many no? So you set Just yourself being okay a goal. with the failure. You set yourself. You set your. You set your goal, and you start hearing people. Maybe your an example would be maybe I said, "Hey, I'm going to make my own movie. I'm going to produce my own movie this year." Mm -hmm. And I write it down. It's my goal. I haven't done this yet. I'm sure in the future I will. Example, yeah. But an example. We talked about this before. I'm going to set this up and I start going out to get funding or uh, to get people and, and people start to say, no, it's not, never going to work, man. Like not for you. Okay. Uh, how many times am I going to hear no until I start to be like, oh, man, maybe they're right. Maybe this, maybe is, I'm too, not good maybe this is too lofty. Yeah. Maybe this is too much. Like, maybe I should settle. Maybe I should settle. Because you're always going to have to face the fact that you're not good enough no matter what, right? But like, yeah. it's maybe I should, ah, oh, no, dude, I'm fine where I'm at. At what point, how many no's does it take until you're like, until you adjust that goal, I guess is how I should dude, say it. Dude, and you know what I see happen next? I see this every day with my sales reps, <laughs> the guys that I work with. Um, my So like in our business, I my part of our business partnership is I focus on how do I make the company money in all ways, sales, marketing, all of it, right? And mm -hmm. what I see with my sales guys is when they start to get into that, like app, I would call it apathy. Okay. It's like you're accepting. <laughs> Oh. you're just like you're just like you're in the mud but you're like you know what i kind of like mud actually right. like you're trying to like justify all the reasons why it's like cool i to could be live off at. of this right yeah. <laughs> right like I, I i had a guy that um he'd just gotten out of rehab and uh, had a really successful first year with me and then we, we were talking about his goals for the next year and i was like tell me what your goals are man he's like and I'm, i'll get into what i was going to say about my salesman originally but i'll okay. tell this first he, i was like tell me what your goals are and he's like you know what i'd really just like to Make enough to where, you know, I'm covering my mortgage every month and, you know, making at least double what my mortgage is. And like, then I'll, you know, eventually pay off the house. I want to pay it off in double the time. So 15 years instead of 30 and things like that. And I was like, what about you doesn't believe that you can actually have something that's just way different than like what your life is currently? Like, why don't you actually believe that you could go choose something that has nothing to do with? So I was like, the best version of you, you see is just paying off your mortgage in double in twice as fast. Hmm. Is that really what like the ideal version of you is doing? Like why? And what I realized is like he was setting goals. And for me, I just felt like he was capable of much more than that. I'm like, yeah. why are we not making a goal that you have four rental properties by the end of the year? Yeah. Because that's more than in your, within your capability. Hmm. He's like, well, I just never really thought about it. And I was like, well, you know why you've never thought about it is because if you set that as your goal, now you understand what it means to fail and you are just so afraid of failure. You'd rather just get like a tiny bit better this year is all instead of just reimagining what you could actually have and what you deserve in your life. Wow. You see what I'm saying? But the reason why he was not thinking bigger is because he uh, just didn't want to set a standard for failure for himself because he was so afraid of failing. Yeah. Because he's been there. He's been in the failures, like the big ones, right? Yeah. So he's so afraid to fail that was not willing to think about what he could actually have in his life and deserve that was much, much bigger than what I thought he was imagining. Of. Absolutely. So sorry to keep talking here, but what I was getting at with my sales guys is when I start to see them get into the apathy stage, what they start yeah. doing is they start bringing out their own objections from people. So let me give you an example, okay? We have this app that lets me listen in real time to what my salesmen are saying to customers on the doors. No way. So I can give them real time no feedback. Way. Yeah. On a, on a customer by customer basis. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm talking with this kid. He's in a slump. He's just not, he's like, he's selling super well, really talented dude. Like he's like your typical guy. You look at him. He's like, that guy is probably can convince anyone to do anything. He's just good looking, athletic. Uh -huh. So you know him actually. Okay. Um, and he's just, he's really charismatic, but he's just in this slump where he's like not believing in himself and is like just really struggling with his sales results. And uh, so I'm like, okay, let me just I'm gonna I'm gonna coach you for a week and we'll get you back on track. I promise. So like immediately, I listen to two pitches and I I message him like, hey bro, um, what did you think about that last pitch? And he's like, well, here's the thing, dude. In this neighborhood, I'm just running into everyone is saying that they love their company. And so they don't want to switch just because they love their company. He's like, and I'm just, I don't know what to do about that. Like, do I need a new area? Something along those lines, right? Hmm. And so I'm like, hmm, interesting. Let me listen to that again. So I listened to the last pitch and I'm like, oh, the, so you're talking about the lady you just talked to who said, I'm good. I've got a company. I really like my company. 
And then she told you again that she loved her company and you just believed that that was true, right? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, well, why wouldn't I believe that that was true? She said it twice. And I was like, listen to this with me, what just happened? So we rewind it and he knocks the door, lady answers and she's like, hey, oh, what are you doing? Oh, pest control. Yeah, you know what? We've already got a guy. We're pretty happy with him. So I pause right there. I'm like, you know what she's saying? She's testing you. She doesn't actually believe that, but she doesn't know you. She, she doesn't yeah. trust you. No one tells you the truth until they trust you. Okay. Yeah. So you just have to assume they're lying. Like This is rule number one in my book. Right. And so I'm like right there, but she didn't say it with a ton of confidence. Did you hear that? And he's like, yeah, I heard that. And then I'm like, okay, listen to how you responded. And he goes, oh, okay. So you've got a guy coming out. Right. And I'm like, did you sound very confident when you responded? And he's like, uh, not really. I could have been more confident. I was like, yeah. So now watch what she does because you didn't sound confident. She digs her heels in and says, oh, you know what? Sorry. You know, you seem like a nice guy, but we love our company. <laughs> and so I was like, I was like, dude, why do you think she said that? It's because she saw that she defeated you with the first objection. Cause she's not really saying I love my company. I mean, maybe she is, I don't know. But like, in my opinion, she's not really saying I love my company. I don't want to use your product or service. She's saying, Hey, I don't really trust you. So I'm going to tell you the most logical thing to make you go away. That's the no I'm going to give you. And I'm just going to see what you do with that. Mm -hmm. Because like, that's the easiest thing I can come up with. I don't want to say, hey, please don't bother me. I'm putting my kids to bed and I'm at dinner. Like nobody's going to say that bluntly to you. What they're going to say is the thing that they think is going to stump you to get you to go away. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So because she said it the first time and then he didn't respond confidently, she said it again because she knew that that stumped him and that that would get him to go away. And what yeah. happened? It got him to go away. So what I mean by that, when salesmen start to get into apathy, it's they start drawing out their own objections. They literally create their own objections by not being confident in the first no. Absolutely. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So I coached him on this <clears throat> and I was like, hey, so you've gotten this objection three times in a row. You're literally creating it for yourself. But let's try this next on the next door. I want you to just respond incredibly confident to that first one. And I want you to say, yeah, I know you're with somebody, but literally that's why I'm here and everyone loves what I'm doing. So check this out. So that's what I coach him to say. And just like that. Right. So it's sure enough. Guy answers the door. He's like, you know, hey, we've got a guy and it's this company that treats the whole neighborhood, which yeah. is even seems like another thing against you. Um, the customer's like, hey, we've got a guy. We, we like him. We're pretty happy with him. And he responds this way confidently, right? Do you think that guy said that again? No, he started listening actually yeah. because he didn't take no for an answer and let that defeat him. And then say, come up with the excuse. Well, I just don't know what I would have done. Everybody loves their company in this neighborhood. It's like, no, you mm -hmm. created that for yourself. Absolutely. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. See how that ties into that rejection? No, yeah, apathy? absolutely. Like, and do you see that with sales reps or not with sales, with, with people you roll with too? I see it. I see it. And I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm looking for, I, I, I'm looking for how many no's it takes them, right? <laughs> Till they start to quit and give up. And then when they get tired, they just actually go to the thing that is easiest for them. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, Rich, they, Rich got me with this time last time. Well, what position was I in? And they like work their way into Because then they just want out. They want out as well. The salesman probably wants out just as much as the person Literally answering did. the door, right? They want out. Well, natural, I think, human tendency is to want out when it gets hard. Yeah. And to not have to face the fact that we have to change. We have to change. We have to get better. Um, Thanks for listening to my rambling. No, there. I love that. I think there's so many things in there. And, and a lot of that, no, I'd wanted to hear what you had to say for salespeople because I want to know at what point do people start to break down? And I would be curious with that salesman, like, when was it, you know, was it the 100th? No. When does this, when does the sales rep, when does the guy in the pursuit of the goal start to break down or yes. when does like the, the prospect when, start to break down and like, give in to their persuasion? Like the first couple weeks he was doing great, right? He'd Killing obviously it. heard no's before yep. and they didn't phase him. Yep. So why, what, what number was it that that no started to get to you? And really what, what other factor was it? Because like the reason why his brain was going to that and, and I'm saying him now just in general, because like right, this happens right. to literally everybody. everyone. I see it every day. Why, <clears throat> why your brain goes to, oh, I'm in a slump. I don't know what's going on now. It's not me. Of course it's this neighborhood or it's the fact that now I'm with so much competition, knocking these same doors. Why does your brain go to that? Well, it's because <clears throat> I'm kind of physically tired. It's more hot outside now. That's right. Absolutely. My girlfriend just broke up with me. Got family problems at home. 
I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Out in the middle of nowhere. My <laughs> wife's having a hard time. <laughs> so what's the and so when you stack enough of those up, it's like the last straw that's like, okay, well, you know what? Of course I should be giving in early. Like I I've got so much stuff in my life, you know. But those are all no's as well, right? Exactly. Wouldn't we agree? Those are all, hey, my wife's not happy here. I don't know if I like this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say no to this plan. I don't wanna be out here. Yep. Or Hey, I, I I agreed to this, but I forgot that it's going to get hot and um, maybe I don't want to do it anymore. Like, uh, that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> maybe the no at the door is okay. Maybe you've prepared for that. Have you prepared for the no in this is really, really hot? Have you prepared for the no in? <laughs> yeah. Maybe you're preparing. not making that goal. But dude, how do you prepare for it? How do you even know to prepare for it? You Man. either fail or you watch someone else fail and then build up the tolerance and resistance to handle what maybe they couldn't have, you know? That's right. And then that's where, where we always come back to like, dude, you have to teach yourself how to handle that no. Mm. And you have to teach yourself how to reset. You have to teach yourself, you have to make that decision early on that nothing's going to stop you. Mm -hmm. Like I told Jerome, you have to make the decision before the fight is even signed that nothing will stop you. <laughs> Nothing. If you don't decide that long before the fight even happens, you will lose. You have to make that decision long before, right? Because because it, it's easy to talk about the per, the people who do start to quit. Yeah. Who do start to readjust their goals, right? And obviously, the guy we're talking about didn't quit because then he he no dude he's he sucked. killing it right now. He, he he's absolutely help, killing right? it right so now. So he reset. He did the right thing. So he he obviously has prepared sufficiently because then he knew what to do, dude. And when you, it got hard, right? You know what the craziest thing about all of this is, is like learning from failure would be so easy if people would just actually realize how, <laughs> how it's not difficult to make the adjustments actually. It's not. And this goes back to, bro, I just, okay, I just installed, <laughs> yeah. I just installed uh, an ice bath, um, like a legit, like ice bath that keeps the water really cold in my house in Texas. And that sounds weird to install that, but because why don't you just go get ice? Well, you, I would spend like five grand on ice if I were to do what I want to do <laughs> yeah. with this thing that just circulates the water yeah. and it circulates it and keeps it at 38 degrees, which is like freaking cold. Okay. Okay. Freezing. Like hurts cold. Yeah. And so I start taking ice baths every day, trying to build up to like six minutes. Right. And I get in and I'm like, mother this freaking sucks dude i'm like i'm out of here bro i like get out and they're like okay i gotta get back in i can't be a little wiener with this right so i get back in and i start trying to just pay attention to how it feels my body's just screaming at me right and i just i'm like no i can't do it i can't do it i'm like watching the clock counting every second and in my mind again it's like hayden it's not that hard you're making it hard by resisting the pain it's like just calm down bro start breathing just like a notice how your body's feeling, check it out, like feel your toes, feel your hands. Do they hurt? Yeah, but what does hurt feel like? Well, it feels a little like prickly here, it feels throbbing here. I was like, what the freak dude? So I caught myself like 30 seconds of just introspective and I didn't even realize how long it had been. Whereas like before I was counting every second, oh, like yeah, an eternity because I was trying to resist the pain, right? So mm -hmm. this goes back to just my the theory we've always talked about which is like, it's not the pain that hurts the most. It's the resistance to the pain that hurts the most. Absolutely. And if you only knew how easy it would be to tweak to be successful, you just probably wouldn't cry so much when you fail, you know? <laughs> Dude, here's another Mike Tyson quote on that that okay. I'd skipped uh, to get to the one where we were. And by you, I mean me too, because I've cried a lot these days, you know? So it's like, <laughs> anyway, go ahead. He says, uh, this. here's another thing Customato would tell him. He says, do what you hate to do, but do it like you love it. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> do what you hate to do, but do it like, like you, you love, love it. it. Dang, dude. That's huge. Custom auto. Wise man. What would be, I mean, what would change in our lives if we did the things we hated to do, but we, but we did it like we loved it? Bro, I, I mean, you know, I, uh, the most successful sales teams I've ever seen are the one where we would do like challenges. Like every day you'd have to pick something that you don't want to do and you have, you have to do it. So if the thought ever crosses your mind, I don't want to do that. No, you have and it's to. like a morally okay thing to do. You have to. Mm -hmm. And so we would just report every day at the end of the day, like, what's the thing you did today that you didn't want to do that you did anyway? Mm -hmm. Um, 
And how do you do Dang, it as bro. if you love it, right? That's cool. Like, how do we go after, what if we go after failure as if we loved failure? Goes what back would to happen? Your, your original question, right? Like, <laughs> right. Well, it, I mean, my mind went to what would happen if we loved, if we just would love to fail. If we love to fail, right? The, here's what I think would happen, right? They say, uh, <laughs> dude, adversity causes some people to break, right? Mm-hmm. But adversity also causes causes other people to break records. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that's interesting. It's and it's true. It's like uh, that's why I like really love. Uh, you know, it's cool to level up because when when you level up, you start to realize like you just create like a, a bigger moat around the success. And then you like light it on fire and you just make it harder and harder for people to get where you are because you're just willing to do more than what people are normal people are willing to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you're not, you're nothing's going to stop you because the failure doesn't, it just gives you knowledge. Yeah. It just helps you do it even better. Right. Bro. That, I mean, that going, wrapping this back up to what we originally, what you originally wanted to talk about was, uh, it's really interesting in our, our theology. That's actually the main premise of why Adam and Eve chose to. So like we don't view the fall as a negative thing. Actually, no, we view no. it as like an essential part of the plan that was orchestrated in order to help us progress. Mm -hmm. And that was the main premise that they realized ultimately was like, it's actually better to know suffering. That's absolutely right. But dude, if you think about <laughs> it, like that's what isn't that basically what, what Adam and Eve were describing is like it, it is better to suffer because then we can know good from evil. And that's so a cool study in and of itself. It's like, what, what's the, just what is that connection? What is that connection? And why then, if that's the case, then why are we trying to avoid suffering so much? Yeah. What's the connection between passing through suffering and change and failure? And how does that actually help us know the difference between like what is good and what is not good? Good and evil dang dude there's a lot to unpack there geez well welcome back then welcome back dude you need to use the restroom real quick i do as always Let's go. <laughs> one of my buddies messaged me the other day he's like hey i just saw you and hated know i think you guys might have something wrong with uh you guys are using the bathroom way too much and he sent me his doctor. <laughs> well, it just so happens that we don't, we just like, forget to go. Right? I mean, exactly. drink, and we both drink so exactly. much water. Like, or is it because we're hydrated? <laughs> I took it. I took it. I said, yeah, send it on over, man. I, I'm willing. I'll even read it to you. It's funny. I was like, all right, bro, I'll take it. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll take get, it. Did you get that checked out or what? I know. Uh, here it says. Uh, Dude, that's funny. He says he thinks we need to see a urologist. That's always, that's, well, dude, well, I mean, it's always the thing with uh, like the prostate stuff. It always starts with like you peeing way yeah. too much. Funny but how. really, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night to pee like multiple times that's in the middle right. of the night, which I, I don't that's personally, right. but it's We're literally good. because whenever we do our podcast, it's right after like both of us have gone to the gym <clears> and <throat> I drink at least a gallon of water at the gym, if not more. I also have this thing where I get excited. If I get excited, I need to pee like before <laughs> fights or before tournaments, dude, I will go pee and then like walk away. And then I'll be like, I need to pee and I'll need to pee again. Like yeah. really, truly me peeing a lot lets me know that you're, dude, you're I'm excited. excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm like a dog pee all over. I just get excited. Man. Dude, that's so I funny. get excited. And you know what? I like that. If I'm not needing to pee, then I'm probably not excited. So uh, keep bringing it on. <laughs> Bring it on, dude. Uh, I, so next episode, we're uh, end of the episode here. But next episode, I'll I'll, I'll take the reins with my story because yes. I I got a good story for you, dude. Okay. On on John Stalupi. So yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. All right.